Okay, it is time for questions to the Minister of Finance, and I call Christopher Stalford to ask the first question. Mr. Stalford. Question number one, sir. The support that the executives put in place for businesses required to close here is more generous than that available elsewhere. Our payment levels are between 800 and 1600 per week, whereas in England, for example, the support ranges from £333 to £750 per week. Therefore, I think the best help we can provide is, is to process the applications we have received as quickly as possible. 89.9% of applications the scheme have been processed by my department. Staff and LPS are working as quickly as possible to resolve these outstanding cases. I have to advise members that a high proportion of applications have been incorrect or ineligible, so it is proven to be necessary to check each one. Outstanding applications from the earlier phase of restrictions are complicated to resolve, with some requiring up to four hours of work by a member of LPS staff to complete. Top-up payments were issued to businesses at the beginning of January. The complexity of the change in changes arising from five phases of health protection restrictions since the start of October has resulted in 27 possible different levels of payment, depending on where a business is located or what kind of business it is. This has required some cases to be held back for additional checks before the top-ups are issued to make sure there are no erroneous payments. Every effort has been made to do this as quickly as possible. Supplementary, Mr. Stafford. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. And the Minister is absolutely right in terms of the, the need to scrutinise and ensure that public money is spent sensibly. Uh, one area of the economy that has been devastated by uh, COVID and the coronavirus outbreak has been that of travel agency. I wonder, can the Minister outline for the House what steps he and the Executive will be taking to aid travel agents who have suffered so much over the course of the past 12 months? Well, I think the member is correct, and that is uh, there are a number of sectors, or if you like, subsectors, that have yet to be uh, properly reached in terms of support. I met with uh, representatives of the uh, travel industry some time back, alongside I think the first and deputy first ministers, uh, and agreed that they had a compelling case. Uh, as far as a, a LRSS scheme is concerned, some travel agents have their own premises, but quite a lot of them will work from home. Uh, do most of their work online, so they don't necessarily fit into that. I have pressed executive colleagues, particularly in the Department of Economy, to try and, and find some uh, way to, to provide support for uh, the travel industry, and I hope uh, to receive some bids from that in the time ahead. But I, I agree with them that it is a sector that does need support, and we have to find some way to try and get that support to them. Nicole Jerry Carl. Mr. Speaker, Minister, several people have contacted me who are still waiting on support uh, from this scheme. They can't get any answers because there's no phone number to ring, obviously. Uh, what would you advise them to do in order to get uh, support and assistance uh, in the middle of this pandemic? Well, I think in the first instance, uh, I've had people who have contacted and, and found in an email sent for instance, were in their junk box and they hadn't accessed them. So I would, I would advise them to continue to check their emails. Uh, there have been a high number of ineligible because there are a range of schemes being operated. Some people have applied to the wrong scheme. Uh, uh, some people have made uh, erroneous applications. You would, you would not believe the amount of people who have sent on wrong bank account details. So when everything is processed, you have to go back to the start again. Uh, there are people who have made multiple applications for the one premises, sometimes up in 14 or 15 applications for the one premises. So a lot of these things will clog up the system, if you like, but I would just advise them to continue checking their emails uh, and wait for a response. And if there, if there is further query and they haven't heard, by all means, he should feel free to contact the department to try and get an answer in relation to it. I call John Stewart. Mr. Speaker, Minister, like, like me, I'm sure you're a, a sports fan and many others in this House are too. And I find it does beggar belief that the LRS scheme has continued to exclude our sports and social clubs throughout Northern Ireland, regardless of the sector they're from. These clubs are run by volunteers for a profit to invest in the club and in the community, and in every scheme they have been ruled out. The Sports Sustainability Fund will not support some of these clubs, and they will go to the wall. Given the massive underspend in the Budget Minister, will you look at that again so that sports clubs can avail of the LRS scheme, having been forced to close? Thank you. Well, the Sports Sustainability, Sustainability Fund is intended to address loss of income, be that loss of gate income loss of hospitality income, because uh, a number of these premises will have a bar or perhaps even dining facilities of uh, golf clubs and other uh, such premises. We did agree that the, the, those sports facilities would go in to the, uh, the community scheme run by Sport A&I uh, to, to get assistance there. 
Uh, and, and the purpose of that is that quite a lot of them have a much bigger rateable premises that they operate out of, of, of all of the facilities they have, but only a proportion of that is the, the bar facility or the food facility, which might have attracted uh, support from, from LRSS. So uh, I, I would be disappointed to find that if, the, uh, if the, there isn't sufficient funds in that to support them. As far as I'm aware, this, this, the scheme is not yet fully subscribed. Uh, so it means that there is funding available in it, and I would encourage sports clubs to do that. I know because this is only coming in now, and LRSS has been paying out on a regular basis for over some time. Uh, a lot of people who previously got uh, the, the 10K or the 25K grants uh, believed they were eligible for this, but uh, it, it was to try and put them all of the sports into the one scheme to make sure they get support, both in terms of loss of gate receipts, but also in terms of loss of business that they might have uh, on that, and, and also to ensure that they weren't being rated for a huge premises with only a proportion of it was uh, in, uh, was dedicated towards hospitality or other such uh, income raising uh, ventures. I call Janet Dolan. Yeah, and, and can I start off by thanking LPS for stepping up and helping to provide economic support during this very difficult time. Minister, given that there is a significant um, COVID support fund available, is some of that funding available to the economy, Minister, for workers and businesses excluded from or ineligible for existing schemes? Well, I have encouraged all uh, ministers to try and reach out to anyone within uh, areas that they would have a sectoral responsibility for who have, have not yet received any funding support, and there are still people out there, there are some sectors that we have mentioned already, and, and, and individuals who have struggled to be able to find the level of support they require. So I would hope uh, that every department who has responsibility for every particular sector uh, will, will take up that responsibility and try and ensure uh, that they reach out to those people and find some way to give them support and time aid, particularly, as you say, as we have funds available to do that. And, and while, of course, we will look at contingency plans for spending those funds and making sure they are spent, I think it is much better to try and get those to people who have not yet received some support. Before I call the next member, I just advise that uh, questions five and seven have been withdrawn, and I call Jerry Kelly. Uh, question two, please. Uh, despite the challenging circumstances, work is progressing well, and we expect the Changing Places facility to be completed in April of this year. Planning approval for the facility was granted in September 2020, with construction work commencing in October. Thank the Minister for his uh, answer up tonight. Um, well, it's good to see that the state is, is leading its way in, in changing places uh, facilities. I'm glad to hear that, that update. Uh, but I'm sure the uh, Minister will agree that uh, these facilities are needed across the north. And maybe he could give us uh, some update on his plans uh, to uh, bring forward or include requirements um, for changing places facilities and uh, building regulations. Well, uh, the Member is correct. Uh, you know, the work on, uh, in relation to uh, in relation to the, the facility down at the bottom of the estate is, has been done voluntarily by the Department for Finance ahead of the requirement. What we, we do intend to do is uh, amend the technical guidance to built-in regulations uh, rather than change the regulations, and, and that mirrors an approach in, in, other, uh, in other administrations. Uh, but the intention of that is that we will make it in any new buildings of a certain type and size that it becomes a requirement to put in uh, changing places facilities. Of course, you can't do that retrospectively, uh, but I, I think we would be encouraging people where they are doing any works to, build, to undertake uh, and recognise that, that, that requirement. I also would be prepared to consider the establishment uh, of a fund to support uh, people or to encourage people, particularly those doing retrospective work, uh, to, to, uh, to bring uh, this type of facility into place. Because uh, when you do hear the stories from people who have had to uh, struggle with no availability of, of this type of facility and change, you know, large, uh, you know, not babies, but change them on the floor, basically, of toilets uh, to change children then. You can see uh, the stress and the trauma that that would present to any parent uh, that has that facility. So I hope the example of the facility we're creating uh, down at the play park will, will encourage others to go along, but we will be changing the regulations to make sure, uh, changing the guidance to the regulations to make sure that that becomes a requirement in the future for a whole range of public buildings. Next question, I call Chris Little. Three. On the 18th of January this year, I advised the Assembly of the Executive's draft budget. This has also been published on my department's website for consultation. 
The draft budget recommends an uplift of approximately 1.8% for the Department of Education's resource Dell compared to its baseline position. This equates to an additional £41.1 million and would bring its opening budget position to £2.3 billion. A capital allocation of £158.3 million has also been recommended, and this is broadly equivalent to the Department's capital allocation in the last financial year. Unfortunately, the spending review has led to a very challenging budget settlement for all departments. Consequently, the education budget could only be further increased by taking money from another department. Supplementary, Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Department of Education is projecting a funding gap of £300 million for 2021 22 further to this budget allocation, which is profoundly concerning for the education sector in Northern Ireland. The Department of Finance commissioned the Ulster University Economic Policy Centre to produce an audit of the cost of division in Northern Ireland in 2016, which found the cost of division in education could be upwards of £95 million per year. Has the Department of Finance conducted any work uh, towards addressing that cost of division and redirecting those funds to the front line of education? Well, as the member will know, the Department's uh from 2017 right through to January last year, uh, were not, uh, had, had no minister in place to try and direct uh, any change in terms of public policy. Uh, and since we've come into place this year, we've obviously been dealing with the uh, very immediate effects of the pandemic. I have to say that the budget settlement that we got for this year was, was hugely disappointing. There was something like £1.7 billion of pressures identified by departments which cannot be met uh, as part of this budget uh, settlement. So, uh, it is a huge challenge. The work that he talks about, I think, is not the sort of work that can be turned around between uh, an announcement of our funding envelope in December and the need to allocate a budget uh, in January and, and legislate uh, for the supplementary estimates by the end of the financial year. So it, that is, uh, I'm sure, work that will continue on into the future, uh, but there's no doubt that all departments will be disappointed with the budget allocation, as are we in the Department of Finance. Well, Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, Minister, uh, this document, the draft budget, which you, you've just been speaking about, doesn't contain um, the underspend that you calculate you will be able to carry forward, nor does it include um, any additional flexibility uh, that the Treasury uh, you think will be able to give. Can I ask uh, exactly what the status is of the conversations you're having with Treasury? What carry forward do you expect to be uh, 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 permitted into the next financial year? Well, the short answer is we don't know because we haven't yet been informed. We did expect uh, on Friday to hear from Treasury uh, finally to get some clarity in relation to that carryover. Uh, we have some sense of expectation of what it might be, but we cannot include it in a document such as uh, the one you've referenced unless we have some certainty attached to that. So uh, the, the sooner we can get certainty in relation to that, and my officials continue to be engaged with Treasury on a daily basis uh, to try and get the certainty that we require, and then the figures can be included in the final budget document. Thank the Minister for his uh, answer so far. I wonder, could the Minister tell us how he would respond to a request from the Education Minister for some of the unallocated COVID funding uh, in order to close the digital uh, divide? The Minister will be aware this is an issue that has uh, had a light shone on it recently where some school children don't have access to adequate uh, IT devices or Wi-Fi? Good. Well, I, I, can I say I have I've invited and indeed encouraged all executive colleagues to make bids uh, for the unspent uh, COVID money, money which has been returned by a number of departments in January. Uh, and I'd be certainly hugely sympathetic to the issue that he describes. I do know that uh, I, I'm aware that, that uh, certainly one company offered the Department of Education assistance uh, free of charge uh, in terms of connectivity, not necessarily the devices, and also uh, in terms of, of the use of uh, the, the use, usage of data on people's phones, which has been eaten up by uh, trying to download lessons. Uh, and I'm not sure that that uh, support was taken up by the department, but I certainly would be very happy uh, to consider and would indeed encourage the Education Minister to make such bids as he has suggested. Rachel Woods. Mr Speaker, um, with relation to the draft budget, can I ask the Minister for an update on the allocation for the Department for Communities, specifically regarding the funding for welfare mitigations, both current and future, and funding for crucial independent advice agencies? Well, I continue to, uh, I mean, the, 
the budget position that, that was agreed was uh, because we got such late notice uh, of the uh, actually funding envelope that we had, uh, and that uh, the uh, outcome was so disappointing that in order to do anything substantially different, we'd have to engage in a reprioritisation exercise, which would mean that some departments would gain out of that and some departments would lose out of that. And given the time frame involved, the executive agreed just to go forward with the same budget allocations that people had received uh, in the last financial year. Uh, and so that uh, has been put out there. Uh, I continue to talk to the Minister for Communities and, uh, and other ministers in relation to the budget allocations, and obviously we want to try and improve the position going into the final budget, uh, uh, the final budget outcome. Uh, but we are waiting on, on, on a range of other issues that haven't been confirmed to us, including which uh, is the flexibility we have for carryover for next year, also other funds which were committed under NDNA and uh, confidence supply, fresh start agreements. Uh, all of these things can make an improved position to our budget. Uh, outcome. Uh, and so we do hope for a better position in the final budget uh, paper that we bring, but at the moment we, we don't have the information necessary. But uh, suffice to say, as I've said on many times, it's a very unsatisfactory situation where you get such short notice and such a poor budget outcome. Well, William Humphrey. So far. The Minister will know that special education needs is a huge and growing problem in our schools. Can I ask the Minister what more resource can he give to the Education Minister to help with this growing problem? Well, the current financial year's budget provided for an uplift of 42 million for special education needs, and that's rolled into the Department of Education baseline for the next financial year. The draft budget proposes a further 10 million uplift to help address uh, special education needs pressures. And if this allocation is agreed in the final budget, it's obviously going to be for the Education Minister to determine how best to utilise the funding and delivery of special education needs services. I call Carol Mullen. Jan Corda, a question for Minister. There are six thematic areas proposed within the new Peace Plus programme. Theme three, empowering and investing in our young people, focuses on children and young people. And this theme includes the following interventions. Learning Together programme to provide direct sustained contact between school aged children from all backgrounds through collaboration between schools and youth organisations. Peace Plus Youth Programme to enhance the capacity of children and young people to form positive and effective relationships with others of a different background and to make a positive contribution to building a cohesive society. Youth Mental Health and Wellbeing will support cross-community, cross-border activities to lead to an improved understanding of youth mental health issues. It is expected the Peace Plus public consultation will commence in February 2021. Thank the Minister for his answer so far. Minister, I have met with Griffiths and Derry, some who currently receive EU social funds and others who don't, and they have expressed concerns to myself around the difficulties in accessing peace, peace funding. Has that been addressed in Peace Plus? Yes, we, we have had a number of uh, conversations with the special EU programmes body in relation to the development of the Peace. Uh, plus program uh, and had conversations also with uh, ministers in the administration in Dublin uh, who have a joint responsibility for that and, and we have collectively uh, expressed the view that was brought to us because as part of those conversations we also spoke to people at grassroots community organisations about their experience of access and peace money over uh, the years and the issue of, of that burden uh, of administration and accessibility was one that came up to us repeatedly so we have asked SEUPB to address that in the current uh, Peace Plus proposals to make sure that the purpose of peace money, which was to really get money very directly onto the ground, communities that were affected by the conflict, that bore the scars of the conflict, still uh, that, that, that those finances were made as accessible to them as, as possible. And they have uh, assured us that that will be the case. The programme has been, uh, will be consulted on this month, so I advise all community uh, and voluntary groups and people who have an interest uh, in, in peace and ensuring that it gets to the areas that it was intended to target uh, to engage in the consultation and make sure their voices are heard. Call Andrew Muir. Much, Mr. Speaker, the Minister will be very well aware of the significant shortfalls in funding designed to replace previous EU funding programmes. What representations is the Minister making in conjunction with the Scottish and Welsh counterparts to the Treasury to address this, despite all the promises were made that Brexit would be great for Northern Ireland? Well, we, we have had uh, continued and sustained engagement, and I met last week with my Scottish and Welsh counterparts, and we discussed 
the issue of flexibility, which we've just discussed, but also the replacement of EU funding. Uh, they have a, the same view as, as we and the executive have, is that EU funding should be replaced in full, as was promised. Uh, it should be given to the devolved administrations to design their own programmes to allocate according to their own priorities. Uh, and as yet, we have no, absolutely no assurance that the direction of travel that seems to be confirmed by uh, Treasury is that they intend to allocate themselves from Whitehall uh, and they intend to use it as part of the levelling up agenda, which I don't think uh, corresponds with any of our uh, priorities here and is more aimed at uh, northern cities in England. Uh, so we, will we do intend and we have agreed that we will continue. Uh, it's just very unfortunate that none of us can actually go to London to meet in Treasury collectively and we have to make joint representations virtually at the moment uh, to Treasury. But we will continue to do that. Uh, I think it's a most unsatisfactory approach uh, by Treasury and by the government in London generally, uh, and certainly not what we were promised. There was to have been a pilot programme for next year, uh, and as yet we have no detail of that at all, and there's a real concern that in the transition of that, that we're actually going to lose substantial amounts of money. Call Rosemary Barton. Minister, thank you for your answers so far. Minister, can you outline the quantum of PACE Plus funding and your expectations of future rounds and allocations? Well, following the uh, discussion between ourselves and Dublin in particular and then with London, we, we have managed to get an increase, which is very, very welcome, uh, contribution from uh, Whitehall, uh, which brings the total amount of funding up to about a billion euros. Uh, that will be over six, six seven years, the, the rollout. The, the current peace programme is continuing to, to roll out to the end of this year, and the, the new funding will come in then from, from the financial year beyond. Uh, so it is a substantial amount of money over six, seven years. There are undoubtedly, as there always is with peace funding, be huge demand uh, on the ground. Peace Plus, as you will know, is, is taken in the interreg proportion of that as well as the peace. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm very pleased that we have managed to bring it up from what originally was sitting at about 650 million euros up to a billion. Uh, and I have no doubt that if we can get the programme designed correctly and if people engage with this consultation as it comes out uh, this month, and then we get the, the best possible usage of that on the ground where it's needed. Chris Stafford. Uh, the Minister talked in an earlier answer about areas scarred by the conflict, and he's absolutely right. And one of the ways in which that manifests itself is in physical dereliction. Can the Minister outline for us what percentage of the coming programme is likely to be devoted to capital works? Because that is one of the ways in which these programmes can actually leave a real lasting legacy in local communities when people see bricks and mortar and physical improvement in the areas in which they live. Well, I, I absolutely agree with the member. Uh, one of the discussions that we did have with the community and voluntary sector and people who had a long running experience of engaging with peace programmes over the years, uh, and one of the points that they put to us, particularly in relation to areas around peace walls, is that you know, while there's a strong desire to see the peace walls removed, there were a lot of things could be done in the interim for communities who live either side in terms of improving uh, the areas themselves and, and that kind of capital investment which lifts uh, an area uh, and, and, and helps people to have a better quality of life. Uh, I'm not, I haven't got the exact figure for the capital part of the programme, but I, I can certainly get that for the member. But that was one of the points I specifically put to SEUPB, that people whose communities had been scarred, not just in the physical sense, but in the, in the sense of the, the, the built infrastructure around them, that there needed to be a look at how we can improve those communities and, and thereby improve the lives of people who live in them. Nicole Mark Durgan. To date, 21,619 applications have been received across all phases of the LRSS. 11,767 applications have been approved, resulting in payments worth £126.85 million. 7,225 7, applications have been rejected for the following reasons. Uh, about 31 per cent of those were duplicate ap applications. 27 per cent were in ineligible business type. 20 per cent not occupying the address on the application. Uh, 6 per cent self-declared not open, and 16 per cent for various other reasons. Members should be aware that many of those who have an application rejected may have had another application which has been approved. This is particularly the case with duplicate applications and applications that were made in respect of the wrong address, which made up half of the rejected cases. I would add that the Executive has established other support schemes, and many applicants who have been rejected by the LRSS are eligible for those schemes. 
Mark Darker, supplementary. Gwyrn Mae Ogut, Cion Cwylio, Ogus Bwia, Hysleis and Aira, Fahunia and Fragra. Is the Minister able to tell us how many of these have been appealed and how many reversed? And does he agree with us that it is unfair and completely unacceptable that businesses in some cases have had to wait almost four months to learn that their application has been rejected and why? Well, as I said, that uh, about half of them uh, in total have either been duplicate applications or an eligible business type. Uh, and I, I accept that this has taken much longer than we had intended. Uh, quite a lot of the data uh, that, that we had expected to get, certainly in terms of close contact services, didn't uh, emerge in a way which was usable. Uh, I also say there have been five different levels of restrictions since the restrictions began again in October, and resulting in 27 different levels of payments. That's a huge complexity for an organisation to manage. Nonetheless, we did, would have wanted it to be responding uh, much quicker than it has. Uh, the, you know, in, in some cases, uh, I know one case in his own constituency, I think there were 14 different applications for the one premises. So 13 of those are recorded as rejections. Uh, but yet to get to the, the one uh, that, that has actually accepted are indeed where people have provided wrong addresses and have corrected the information, then those uh, count as rejections as well. So there is an appeal process. I don't have the exact figure of how many people have got through the appeal process, but it still uh, is ongoing. Uh, there are huge complexities in business and a significant amount of error in terms of applications, which uh, I know that people have been frustrated waiting on all of this, uh, and the team working on it have been doing this as quickly as they possibly can. Uh, but it is, at, on some stages, there are, these things almost have to be hand-sifted uh, to make sure uh, that, that some of the details that have been presented are correct. But uh, I would still encourage people, if they aren't satisfied with the outcome, to appeal, and those appeals will be heard. Kerry Middleton. Can I thank the Minister for his answer so far? Uh, the Minister will be aware that amongst those unsuccessful applications were, as mentioned earlier, the sporting social clubs. Uh, the Minister for Communities indicated that a new scheme would be developed to look at those who were not eligible for the LRSS. Um, can the Minister confirm that if those conversations are ongoing, and if not, will he tie in with the Department for Communities Minister to ensure that that does happen? Well, the, the scheme that they were to apply to is that uh, Sports Sustainability Fund. Uh, which takes account of lost income for all sporting organisations, was organised in conjunction with the overarching sporting bodies themselves. Uh, so uh, that's, that's what we agreed. Those conversations have taken place and agreed that that was uh, the place for those people to go. As I say, in terms of trying to fit them into an LRSS scheme, you'll find that the rateable premises that might provide the hospitality, for instance, in the sports club is a small portion of that. So they would be rated as a huge premises uh, but yet it's only a smaller proportion that's actually involved in that business side of things. So uh, it was agreed between ourselves and communities that the sustainability fund, which can look at lost income, uh, both in terms of gate receipts and other lost income, maybe through sponsorship or whatever else, uh, plus hospitality, which takes into account what uh, the facilities they had were earning in terms of uh, food and drink, uh, and that that can be measured in a more accurate way than per sports club, and that that was the scheme. So that is the scheme that was devised for that. That is ongoing. Uh, applications have opened to it, uh, and I'm told that it hasn't been fully subscribed yet, so I would encourage clubs to, to ensure that they follow that through. Martina Anderson. Uh, Minister, many businesses in the transport sector have received insufficient support, COVID support or none at all. How many bids have you received from the Infrastructure com uh, Minister with regards to those businesses who have been excluded? I'm particularly mindful of taxi operators and those businesses who have, or drivers, taxi drivers, who received insufficient funds during this COVID pandemic. Well, I've, I've encouraged to. Uh, I've encouraged the, the, the minister did receive uh, funding for a bid that she made earlier in the year, and obviously the Department for Infrastructure are responsible for the operation and the payout for that scheme. I know there has been there have been further bids to support those sectors again, which uh, I'm very happy to recommend to the executive. Uh, and, and again, I think in the case of operators, there was some discussion whether they fitted into a scheme that the Department of Economy were running uh, or, or into the taxi driver scheme. Uh, I'm not sure how that was resolved between the ministers uh, involved. Uh, but I have encouraged, as I say, in general terms, people to ensure that they have bids in to make sure that any sectors who feel they were left out are not fully uh, supported, uh, that they make an effort to reach out to them in the short time ahead to try and get as much support as we can to them. That ends the period for a list of questions. We move now to 15 minutes of topical questions. I call 
Alan Chambers. Mr. Speaker, uh, Minister, uh, do you plan to continue uh, making payments to successful applicants of the localised restriction support scheme? Yes, for as long as the restrictions apply, uh, we have uh, told uh, LRS and we have advised the executive. Indeed, we bid for uh, an additional £100 million ourselves of the of the COVID funding that was available uh, to continue on those schemes for as long. Now, when we get to the end of March, uh, where we are with that then is a different story because the COVID funding that's been available next year is about 500 million. Health will take up a very significant proportion of that. That compares with the 3 billion COVID funding we had this year. So uh, certainly, at least until the end of March, we will continue to pay out businesses as long as they are, are, are prevented from opening. Supplementary, Alan Chambers. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for his reassuring answer. But can the Minister say if there are any cases where payments won't have continued without any correspondence from your department to explain why this has happened? Well, I would hope not. Uh, I, I can't say for absolutely certain of every piece of correspondence that goes out or doesn't go out of the department, uh, but it should be the function of LPS. And as, as I say, bear in mind, LPS were a rates collection agency and they repurposed themselves and, and, and had to gain uh, extra powers to be able to be a payments agency, which they have done uh, at times uh, in very challenging circumstances and, and, and to the frustration of those who were on the receiving end of payments, but nonetheless have, have paid out uh, in total over this course of this pandemic a huge amount of money to business support on the ground. Uh, but if people haven't been corresponded with pro properly, then I would invite the member to contact myself and the department. We will ensure that that is rectified. Mr. George Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> is the minister confident that he will not be re returning any COVID money back to Her Majesty's Treasury? Well, I think the priority will be to try and get uh, flexibility to carry over money to the next financial year. That's, that's our first priority because. As I was outlining in an earlier question, we have a very challenging budget situation uh, for next year for all departments. Uh, and the more carryover we have, the more we can try and meet some of the pressures that departments might be facing next year. Uh, I have also encouraged all ministers in all departments to, uh, to look very strongly at the sectors that they should be offering support to and to see if they can continue that support, uh, rerun schemes, uh, try and reach out to sectors who perhaps haven't got sufficient or any support at all. Uh, and I continue to encourage that. I have contingency plans developed to make sure that we can spend out all of the money that we have, uh, but I would prefer to see as many sectors as we possibly can get in support in, in the number of weeks we have left in this financial year. Supplementary, George Robinson. Minister, does the Minister agree that he has held on to too much money for too long, and this, this has made it difficult for depart departments to spend much needed money, which can, in some cases, such as dry cleaners, sewing businesses and others, they could go to the wall. Well, can I say, when we, we had the COVID allocation prior to Christmas, uh, we had significant injection. We allocated all apart from 26 million, I think it was. So the money that we are now attempting to allocate is money that has come back from departments. So it wasn't a question of sitting on money at all. We did allocate out all of the money. We, we only kept uh, a, a relatively small proportion of money for after Christmas. And in some senses, we were concerned we might leave ourselves short. But there had been such a return, for instance, health returned about £90 million. The Department of Economy returned something similar. Uh, very significant returns from a number of departments. And of course, we want to get those spent. And we do want to see the businesses that he is, particularly those small businesses who are struggling. We want to see support uh, uh, provided to them and, and those businesses reached out to. And that's why I've encouraged all departments that have responsibility for all of the different sectors to try and ensure that they. Uh, respond to the needs of those sectors and make bids accordingly, and I will be more than happy to recommend those bids if they come in. Nicole Tugbini. Mr. Speaker, uh, Minister, just, just referring to um, uh, the letter you put in the library today in answer to Mr. Allister's uh, question about the, the centenary, where you said, uh, centenary, where you said uh, the British government has created a fund for the centenary, and of course it has, um, which is, is a, a three million pounds. Uh, fund. But could I ask the Minister, have you had any departmental bids uh, for, for any funding in regards to the centenary? Well, uh, and the reason I, I had made that comment, because the TEO had been responsible for the decade of centenary, and I wrongly assumed uh, that that responsibility was with them. Uh, I haven't uh, had any bids for that. Uh, I, I would have to go back and check uh, all of because, uh, as the member will understand, when we rolled over the budget, it was simply the same allocation as last year, it was something like 1.7 billion of unmet 
pressures uh, from all of the departments, so I would need to check exactly was this identified by TEO as a pressure that they wanted to meet uh, or not. Uh, but I, I'm not aware at this moment that any bids have been made from any particular departments, but I, I'm, I'm happy to check and come back to the member. Supplementary, Doug Beatty. Thank you. Um, and Minister, I thank you for that. And I guess, I guess my, my, my follow-up question is, is, is very obvious, and, and um, if I can put it, um, and that is, would your department be be receptive to any bids from, say, uh, the Department for uh, the Economy to celebrate uh, our economic power over the last 100 years, or the Department for Health to celebrate our NHS, uh, or uh, indeed um, agriculture to, to celebrate our farming uh, during this centenary? Would you be open to receiving those bids? I'm always open to receiving bids. It's not my, not my responsibility to make a political judgment uh, on the bids themselves. And, and we can have an argument about what an economic powerhouse we are or how successful our agriculture has been and dependent on, on, on Europe for support, uh, which, which uh, we would hope might be continued by the British government. There's certainly no guarantee of that. Uh, we see where our agriculture is on the other side of that. Uh, but nonetheless, it's not up to me to make a judgment. I'm happy to receive bids. What we do is we, we judge them according to the, the the value for money aspect and the proposition they put together. My department makes a judgment, and I, rec I make a recommendation or a proposition to the executive, and they decide. So I, I don't decide on the merit. Ultimately, it's the executive itself that decides on the merit of any bid and any fund allocation. Nicole Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the minister why he has not made provision for labour market intervention schemes within his draft budget? Well, there are, as I said, there are something like 1.7 billion unmet pressures. Uh, so, when departments, uh, when the uh, executive agreed that with the budget outcome we had and the time frame available to try and, and consult and get the necessary legislation done, there was no time for a significant reprioritisation exercise. So, essentially, the money that departments had from last year was rolled over. So, it is going to be up to the ministers in those departments to make calls in relation to what their priorities are. And that's going to be challenging. And that's why, alongside that, I'm pushing, of course, for as much flexibility as we can to carry over to next year to meet some pressures that, that are arising from all of the departments. Uh, but ultimately, it will be for ministers in those departments who have the same level of funding they had last year. Uh, to make calls in relation to what their priorities are, and, and I'm sure that the issues he has outlined, which I think cross both communities and the Department of Economy, will be ones that the ministers will be considering. Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, the minister would be aware that announced uh, from Westminster was a programme called Kickstart, and indeed that that programme was introduced in September of, of last year, and the Minister for Communities wanted to do a bespoke scheme in Northern Ireland and indicated that it would be titled Job Start. According to her department, the department was unable to launch the scheme on the 14th of December, September, December, as planned as there was no financial funding available for labour market interventions. And therefore, that scheme is now dormant at the very least. Yes, and it would have been at that stage that the Department, with its, uh, its good intent to launch uh, additional schemes, particularly recognising the, impact, the economic impact that the pandemic has had, uh, uh, I have no doubt w with, was well-intentioned in terms of, of wanting to launch the scheme. We only learnt on the 25th of November what our funding envelope was for the budget. That was only confirmed on the 10th of December. So the Department then realised that they had simply the allocation they had, had last year with no scope for additional uh, programmes that they might want to carry forward. So that's the draft budget proposition. It goes through a process of consultation and engagement with all ministers and uh, other areas that we're looking to in terms of uh, funding possibilities. Uh, and then it will reach the final uh, budget proposition stage. And if the position doesn't improve for departments, then they're going to have to look at if they consider a priority for certain schemes, then what other schemes might, might they have to drop to, to meet that priority. All right, Beggs. Minister, uh, earlier in listed questions, you indicated that because of the relatively short notice of the final budget allocation, uh, you didn't have adequate time to consult. So do you accept that other devolved regions, such as Scotland, commence consultation well in advance of that final allocation, and so we're in a much better place to prioritise and to decide where we should spend our money? Well, they might have been uh, consulting early, but they didn't know the amount of funding they had. Neither did Wales, and I had a conversation with both finance ministers uh, uh, during the week, last week, 
and Scotland only launched their budget last Thursday, I think it was. Uh, so they may have been out having a broad consultation in terms of what priorities people would like to see. And of course, we have about £1.7 billion pounds worth of pressures that departments would have liked to have spent money on that they cannot now meet. Uh, so it, 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 it's a question of judgment. People can go out and consult if they wish. But if they don't know the front and envelope that they're operating from, uh, arguably the consultation is, is rendered null and void. Uh, because certainly, uh, in relation to the last question that was asked, the department, in all good intent, wanted to do a scheme and then found out very abruptly at the end of November, start of December, that the fund was no, not available for that unless they reprioritised within the department and decided to take funding from somewhere else. Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I fully accept that no one can make final decisions until the final amount is, is, is revealed. But would the Minister still not accept that if consultation had happened, you'd be much better placed to react? And indeed, will you be falling in line with the previous recommendations about how to modernise our budget process so that we have a meaningful consultation with the public, our stakeholders and indeed assembly committees? Well, in order to react, as he said, if, if uh, an earlier consultation process, without any sense of what the fund amount was, had thrown up priorities that the executive agreed with, in order to react to meet those, the executive would have had to go on into, once we learned the outcome of the budget, gone into a reprioritisation exercise where some departments would have lost money in order to meet some of the priorities from other departments. And, and with the time frame available to us, that was going to be very difficult, if not impossible. I do agree with them in terms of the budget process and making it more transparent, more accessible, and we've been working on that and will continue to work on that. And I know he reminded me that when we were in the Finance Committee together, uh, that we, many years back, that we had pushed this idea, and I'm still wedded to that idea of a, a simpler and more transparent and more accessible budget process for people. Uh, but of course, the spending review, which gave us our front envelope, was to have taken place over last summer. It was pushed back into the autumn, and we didn't get the final amount until the 25th of November, and then not confirmed until the 10th of December. So all good intentions of this institution are dependent on what uh, processes run through over in Whitehall. Uh, and if they stall or delayed, and, uh, it, can, it can throw our best intentions uh, awry. But nonetheless, I do think we do need to continue that work to simplify and streamline and make more accessible the budget uh, process. John O'Dowd. Uh, uh, Minister, you, you'll be aware that there are many students and, and the hard-pressed families waiting an announcement in relation to financial support from the Department of Economy. Can you give us the latest status report in terms of bids received and progress made? Yes, uh, I, I, I absolutely accept. I know the member made this point, I think, last week uh, when I was in the chamber uh, doing a statement. In relation to students, I absolutely accept there's a very significant level of hardship and stress among students who have been paying. Uh, both in terms of for courses, but also in terms of accommodation uh, and not being able to access either in a very satisfactory manner. Uh, and so there is very significant hardship. Uh, I, I, I noticed <laughs> in some party political campaigns around these issues that they're identifying me as the problem. Uh, I'd never be identified when the solution's found. I'd never get the credit for it, but there you go. That's politics for you. Uh, but of course, it's the economy minister has responsibility for students. Uh, she has made a bid for a significant uh, amount of money for support, and she advises me that she's intending to make a further bid for another significant amount. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. I hope it meets the needs of students in the way that have been identified, uh, and I hope perhaps that when that funding is allocated, maybe some of the other political parties will credit both of us for the success of that outcome, or perhaps not. John O'Dowd. The, the Minister will be aware that uh, failure is an orphan and success is many guardians. Uh, but in terms of uh, on another group on our society who have been left behind in terms of support, the Micro Business Fund, has there been any bids received to reopen the Micro Business Fund? Not as yet. Uh, I have encouraged the uh, Economy Minister uh, that there are a number of very small sectors uh, who still struggle to get support or haven't got sufficient support, and that, that might be a means of addressing that. Uh, so I wait to see as their bid comes forward for that. But I'm, I'm very uh, keen to make sure that we get support uh, to sectors and to individuals who haven't been able to access it to date, and uh, that would be one way of addressing that. And time is up. Can members take reads for a moment or two, please?